A huge underwater volcanic eruption in Tonga earlier this year devastated the seabed for 50 miles, scientists say, and they're stunned at the scale of the damage. Now, as we've been reporting this morning, and Carol will like this, uh, scientists say they are stunned by what they've been learning about the ferocity of the eruptions of an underwater volcano that you might remember. It took place uh, near Tonga uh, back in January, beginning of the year. Yeah. Now, this is the moment the submerged mountain literally blew its top. Mm -hmm. It sent ash and water vapour halfway to space and generated tsunami waves which were felt around the globe, including in Hastings. In Sussex? Yes. All that way. Well, let's find out more about the new discovery, all the information that's come from that explosion. Uh, volcanologist uh, Mike Burton joins us here in the studio. Good morning. Thanks for coming in. Good morning. Thank you. It sounds to me like this particular volcano has given you an insight into volcanoes like you've never really had before. Is that right? I think that's true. Uh, and uh, the thing about volcanology is, is it's still relatively new science. And we're still learning more and more after each large eruption. And, and this is probably the largest eruption that's uh, ever been measured with modern instruments, um, reaching 58 kilometres up into the atmosphere, which is an unprecedented measurement. So let's just remind ourselves of what happened. <clears throat> so the volcano disappeared. So the volcano is mostly submerged. Just right. a little bit of it was uh, above water when, when it was active. And it was active for several months beforehand. Um, and it looked as though things were going quiet after there had been a series of explosions. And then in January, um, it began erupting again. First of all, with a large eruption, um, going up to about 20 kilometres. And it looked normal. It looked as though this was a typical... Mike, that's not normal to me. <laughs> that's not normal to me. <laughs> not in my house. <laughs> Relatively normal. Uh, <laughs> and then it did something absolutely extraordinary, which surprised all the volcanological community, um, because it suddenly pushed this eruption column so high up in the atmosphere. And, and what was peculiar about it is, is it went much higher than the previously the largest eruption we've ever seen, which is uh, the 1991 eruption of T Pinatubo. So just describe to us what we're seeing here. So here we're watching that cloud reaching up high into the atmosphere. And it looked as though it was powered by the interaction with seawater. The key process here was that there was the hot magma mixing with the with seawater producing a much larger more powerful explosion almost like a pressure cooker with it causing much of the seawater to evaporate and f cause a steam cloud which powered the eruption much more than we've normally seen and we're still trying to understand exactly why that happened and what was the trigger because it done a whole series of explosions without this effect and then finally it was uh, producing this big shock wave that went around the world multiple times which we could see there this is incredible wave of pressure which just transported itself several times around the, around the planet and was measured in the UK and all over the world. Several times? Several times, yeah. yeah. And is that really unusual? The, the last time we saw something like this was the Krakatawa eruption in 1883. And that was measured, obviously, the instrumentation they had back then is different from what we have today. Um, but it, it is extremely unusual to see such a big shock wave arising from an eruption like this. You mentioned the pressure of the seawater. Do you know why it was so big? So that's the key question that we're trying to ask ourselves, is, is what was it about the geometry of the caldera, the, the, the volcanic shape structure it was sitting in, that helped to accelerate it to this degree? And, and I think that's still an open question. Um, one of the key things that we have to understand is, is that in volcanology, in terms of volcanic eruptions, we've been studying them in detail only for a about 50 or 60 years with modern instrumentation. And although there's records, oral records from all over the world, our understanding of the impact of these eruptions is still growing. And in many ways, I, I feel like we're not really prepared for understanding just how big an impact even a larger eruption could have on the UK, on, on, in terms of the global population, in terms of the global economy. I guess part of the issue is, I mean, Tonga, you can't get much further from here than Tonga, so it well, seems like such a remote thing, but... It's interesting you're saying that it can have, literally, can have an impact on, on our lives here. Well, we saw um, other eruptions in Iceland in 2010 and more recently have had a big impact in terms of the air travel uh, when the very difficult to pronounce uh, Fatal Yokotal eruption, oh, uh, well done. my best attempt <laughs> to that, um, erupted. Uh, that, that obviously disrupted air travel. But, and I think the thing is, is that 
again, our understanding of the impact of eruptions is only largely based on what we've seen already. And we've only been really measuring these for such a short period of time compared to the history of volcanoes. So we, what we do is we look at deposits of other eruptions to see how, um, what the impact and what the magnitude of these, th these eruptions can be. We've got a lot to worry about at the moment. We have enough on our plate. And yes. um, every morning we're giving people stories of doom and gloom. Do we need to worry about volcanoes as well? I think we do, I'm afraid. I, I, we do. We have to keep on studying them. We have to keep understanding them and be setting up monitoring systems which allow us to forecast when they do go. Because the good thing about eruptions is, and larger eruptions, is the bigger the eruption, the bigger the precursors to it. So we can so actually have an idea. So where are you watching now? Well, the really interesting and powerful thing we have at the moment is, is a ever better global monitoring um, using satellite data. So satellites provide a, you know, a, a snapshot over the whole globe every day of how much gas is being produced by volcanoes and, and also the, the way in which volcanoes deform and inflate before an eruption. Um, but I think we're still is an open research question about how to put all that together in, in a, in a real-time mm. capacity so that we can accurately forecast things. But the, the, that capacity is growing and it's extremely exciting. We just need to keep on working on it. And as for that one in, in Tonga, I mean, could that one blow again? Certainly could. It has a history of, of frequent eruptions. And from the most recent research that's come out today, um, it, it seems that there is actually an ongoing new eruption going on there, much smaller in size, but it's continuously active. And so the chances of it repeating its activity at some point in the future is, is very high. And the information that you're working on at the moment must be useful. Absolutely. For everybody. Yeah, I mean, the more we understand, uh, the better we can grasp what the likely impacts could be of a future eruption, and the better we can forecast when that eruption can be uh, and the, the magnitude of it. But the key thing is to keep on studying these things and making use of the ever-improving uh, data which is available to us. And the fact that we have this global capacity now means we can even study volcanoes which are completely far away from um, from populations, and even th and even though they may they're less dangerous to the local population, they can still have an impact globally, as as we've seen in this most recent example from uh, Honga Tonga. Yeah, Mike, thanks so much for coming in. Fascinating. Pleasure. Thank you very much.